All right, good, good, good. I think that did it. Well, I guess it would be nice if I could give your heart away. I know not all the games you play. Well, I play them too. Baby. What the fuck? What is going on? Okay now. God. Old man yelling at his computer. Why did it come to this? Didn't have the hustle. That's why. That's why I'm here officially fiddling with devices that are simply not for me. They're for tweens. They're for dead-eyed Zoomer would-be child soldiers. Ah, oh, someone was playing Katamari Damacy. I would like to play that sometime on a stream. Hopefully we can get in the damn office after the COVID uh, murder festival is over and we can uh, record some stuff. We want to do Black Ops. We weren't able to do it because no one feels comfortable now being in the same room. But when we are, we will do Katamari Damacy. We will do Black Ops Cold War. We'll do the whole thing. Uh, oh, but yes, here I am, slave to machinery beyond my comprehension. A device that's it's just, yes, as I said, it's, it's for those who were born into it. It came in too late in my life. I expect too much from the real world. I'm muffled? Fuck off! Do tell me this. I've had enough issues today. Telling me I'm goddamned muffled. All right. They're saying I'm not muffled, but once again, we are left with the horrible reality that we could all be Cartesian brains and vats. And I have no idea if you're lying to me or not. Or if you think it is, but other people don't. I don't know what the color blue is to you, man. Well, today I wanted to talk about faith, specifically bad faith, but really, more accurately, lack of faith. I've talked before about how online requires you to treat everybody in bad faith because there's a, you don't know, because you're not trying to determine a course of action, you're trying to determine a status hierarchy. So you are never approaching someone uh, on the sake of their good intentions because they are a competitor with you. They are a competitor, as Daniel Plainview saw it. Even if you don't think of them as such, even if you think of them as comrades, in the social media hierarchy that we're all embedded within and are motivated by without our knowledge, we are competitors with one another. So it's not so much that uh, we're assuming bad faith, it's that we are practicing a lack of faith because we, when we imagine other people's motivations, tell me if I'm wrong here, but this is how I think we really do imagine others' motivations. You have to, at a certain base, assume that other people are like you because you are the only reference point for humanity. The definition of human is you because you're the only one you know. So you are the only person you know. So you're, that's the only standard you can use for what, uh, for what a human wants and why, how they operate. And I would posit that since we are all in like the postmodern era where none of us really believe in God, even people who are deeply religious in this, in this, I will say at the level of population where it matters, not individually, we effectively live in the secularized world that the modernity has created and that pluralistic society demands and that capitalism requires. Some good things, some bad things, all of them come together to bring us to a point where we cannot invest our religious faith with actual emotional power because we don't get to live it. Because we don't get to live the part of religion that actually generates feeling and not just a dry narrative. A, 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 a calculus. If I do this, I go here. Or whatever the fuck. 
the feeling of what oneness is if you're a Buddhist or what, what uh, God is if you're a Christian or something. That sensation is, is uh, generated by physical existence, by your life, by the practice of your days. And those, as much as they are determined by the market, they cannot be imbued with those things because your actions are alienated during the, all of the time that you are operating at the command of this capital or within this market context, you cannot live the way, you cannot live religion the way that people in pre-capitalist uh, civilizations did. Now, like I said, that's a good thing in that you couldn't do that because religion is so specifically fixed. Uh, that, uh, because religion, when you have like, the, ter the terrible thing you want with religion, the worst thing you want is when you have that real faith combined uh, with any kind of power. But for the most part, that is like the faith of the powerless because it's the faith of the mass of people who in all historical figures are oppressed. But as we become less oppressed, as the evolution of you know liberal democratic principles that go alongside the evolution of capitalism, we are able to exercise freedom on a personal level in the marketplace. And that changes our ability, that changes our, um, uh, uh, the way we perceive religion. And it abstracts it away from sensation and towards rationalism, which is the Protestant movement, and which is the, the, religion, the Christianity that pervades in America. So everyone, I think, does not really believe in God in this country in that, that they are believing in their head something that they don't feel, other than in maybe fits and starts, and the thing that they take with them is, a, uh, is basically wrongly translated by their cultural wiring, so that even the moments that they actually do feel, the real sensations, get channeled into this, uh, uh, this, this just market practice, this mental conception that doesn't have a practical expression in the way you live and what you do. And so when we act in the world, we're acting from a principle that there is no God, there is no eternal judgment for our actions. Therefore, we are ha forced to act in this world existentially as, even if there is no free will, we must act as though there were and choose, choose things to do. That's it. That's all we can do. Now we can do that because we think that we can build a, 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 a scaffolding of reason to say that there is actually a God and that that God is real and that that God makes you do things. And then you can make your actions accord with a deeper desire. But absent that, all you have is your, your drive, however it's been shaped by your cultural exp uh, experience. What you think you want, that's what you are operating from. And that's true of everyone else. And so it is a narcissistic point of view. That is what we are supposed to be, homo economicus. And that's what we've been turned into by capitalism. In this, the most advanced capitalist society. Now, you can say, but then why, are, why would people be, you know, uh, left-wing in that? Why would they not just want Hobbesian war of all against wall? Well, some of them are captured by the consequentialist arguments that, uh, and the pragmatic arguments, the reasoned, rational arguments, that cooperation in the long run is better than competition. It's more efficient. Because it is, it, it, I would ra it is less wasteful and more pleasurable to live in a peace than in an anxiety of domination, basically. And that we should all cease, we should seek that through an application of our reason. But that's on top of our personal desire to live in a society that, that we, as we currently exist, would want to live in, which would provide us with the stuff that we want, which we don't really want, which is it's our libidinal drive wrapped up in our cultural experience. Now, the thing is, is that because we inhabit ourselves and no one else, and we experience our whole lives, everything that goes into our lives, all of our narcissistic desires and their expressions in our existence, you know, the way that we hurt other people or, you know, seek selfishly and have it backfire or be rewarded, 
All of those things are experienced from the inside. So we know why we did it. And so we forgive ourselves at a certain level. And we justify why we did things and why we want things. And we have this ball of justifications around a lifetime of actions. And so we know we're, we're operating in good faith because we know what came before us. We project outward to everyone else that essential assumption of narcissism, but removing any accompanying trust that comes from knowing why someone is the way they are, knowing why they believe what they believe and why they want what they want. All you see is the naked desire, stripped of any context, any kind of uh, uh, extenuating circumstances, any kind of, like, any reason, just pure, hostile, competitive drive that you have to compete with. And that is where the bad faith comes from, is everyone is operating for the assumption that everybody else, even in their comradely spaces, where everybody is a good socialist, but yeah, but what do they really want? Where are they really interested in? Because what would I really be interested in if I was somebody else, like me, but worse? Like me, but not justified for the things I did? Well, guess what? A lot of those people are just as justified as you, but because you don't know them, you didn't experience that from the inside, you don't know, you can't, you don't operate from that assumption. You operate from the assumption that they are you stripped to the barest id. And so that's why there can be no meaningful solidarity at the intellectual, ideological level of online uh, or even organizational left uh, politics. Because everyone is, because absent the unifying experience of a class identity and a class life, to push you towards that, you just go in a hedonic circle, banging into everybody else. And like, if, the, if we die out, if humanity is destroyed, if we do get to the common ruin of the contending classes, which at the end of Marxism, if you end up with that option, if, the, if it clicks zero, if it clicks black instead of red, uh, you go, you're done. Because it's a totalized, it's, a whole, it's an ecosystem now that is like the, the, uh, the feedback loops are fully developed because the market is totalized. And the economy is totalized and, and, and technology is totalized. So it's, it's, it's one and the other. So common root of the ten, contending classes at the end is Kaputsky. It will be because everyone operated from that assumption. And because you cannot have a society where everyone is operating for that assumption that is not pure capitalistic exploitation. That's how it will end up always. And the libertarian sees that reality and says, good. Because I, we, I am stripped of any emotional uh, connection to the world around me, which is our, my actual understanding of my connectedness to the rest of the, the universe. Like emotions are our sense, literally, of connection. It cannot be expressed. If it could be expressed, there would not be all these disagreements about religion. There would not be this spiritual deadening if you could just say it. You literally have to feel it. it. You have to feel it. And that's why, like, you can't even, and like, there's no, you can't say, like, the old post left, the 90s post left, the Bob Black guys, like, eco primitive guys, guess what? We will just rise from the ashes and do it again. We will rise from the ashes and do it again. Unless we get to a point where species, uh, the, the world spirit, the old Hegelian conception of a, of a species coming into awareness of itself biologically as a species, the way that a consciousness comes into awareness, it is a, they are nested phenomenon. You get to a point where technology, our ability to, to like manage production homeo and create homeostatic uh, interactions between the, our biome and ourselves, cellu like individually within uh, our, our species and then with other species. That cannot be done in the absence of a technological development. Not just bare technology, but social technology. The, the unembedding of people from parochial, pre-modern social formations that do not allow for the interaction between 
uh, other societies or a system where the deterritorialized subject is re-territorialized into the same organic relationship with his community as existed in pre-modern societies, but the community now is the human race. Okay, I hope that made sense. That got a little abstract, I think. I know. I know it did. Oh. Because, like, let's see, let's go back to the, 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 the presidents as, uh, as pop, pop culture models, that since now, uh, you know, politics is fully fused with entertainment at the level of, like, not, not no longer, like, subtextually, you know, like, in the Debordian sense, as in directly, like, our, 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 our social relationships stripped to market transactions that interact with our... Uh, choices within a spectacle that consumes both politics uh, and entertainment. And we've coughed up these two, this thesis and antithesis, these two gods uh, around these two uh, sets of cultural mores. We got the prestige TV antihero in Obama, who I talked about last time, and then the reality TV star in Trump that I didn't talk about as much, and I want to bring him up back up. Because in both cases, what you have is the dream, the dream, because it has to be a dream. It's not a nightmare because they're enjoying it. They wouldn't be watching if they weren't. That's the crucial thing to understand here. Everyone is enjoying themselves. Yes, their lives are miserable. But when it comes to politics, they are enjoying themselves. In fact, if you really want to break down my college, non-college divide, it might boy. boy basically boil down to uh, are you enjoying yourself or not when you interact with politics? And I mean at the deep level. Like, are you engaging with it to get off? If you are not, if it's imposing on you, I think you're going to find the whole fucking spectacle of, of this, uh, this pseudo-class war that we're biting and this c cultural expression of this confused attempt to sort people into meaningful like uh, 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 categories. Well, Ignoring this vast number of people for whom this whole thing doesn't mean anything, but is supposed to be very important to them, and are going to over time get more hostile. And they're going to form up with those people within the bubble who are hostile, who are driving the conflict with their other half. The half that insist on mores and norms, and insist on you not enjoying yourself in order to enjoy yourself. And saying, yes, of course, we're all having fun here. But as Democrats, the way we have fun is not having fun. The way we enjoy ourselves is by denying ourselves. Why? Well, see, we went to school. And when we went to school, we found out that if you are quiet, sit at your desk, uh, uh, be respectful to other people, uh, and uh, are, co are good in interpersonal interactions and, and sensitive uh, and, and uh, conscious of others, well, and, and you pay attention in school, and you learn things, and you're good at it, where you get a, a piece of paper that lets you get a nice job where you don't have to work with your hands and you get to imagine yourself as somebody who could be the protagonist in one of the shows you watch, like the job. And so the things that get you that are these things. So now I know all that stuff that the carrot at the end of this doesn't exist anymore. There's no applause. No, you're not getting that. You're not getting any of this. These are gone. Those jobs are over. That's not a thing anymore. This paper only make, gives you debt that you got to pay off any way you can find out. But you should still do all this stuff because it makes you a better person. And we're over here deciding who's good and bad, and we're going to put you on our side if you do. If you don't, now, once again, it doesn't confer anything to you. And once again here, we're talking about everyone who is operating essentially from total narcissism because it is the godless cosmos. Who is taking that deal when the other team says, have some fucking fun? Because front was prestige TV, but hey, network television, but with more boring parts. Network, network television, but with more stuff that you're supposed to think about instead of just pure sensation. 
So the entire pre prestige TV genre is about sublimation. And it's this, this, these guys, who, the people who watch it, the boys and girls who watch it, they're in, participating in this erotic sublimation. But they have to have been initiated into that to care. Outside of that are the people who think, this is, why, why would I want to do that? Why would I want to root for a losing team, essentially? When I can get with the winners, or at least who I imagine the winners to be. And I can imagine myself to be a winner. Instead of pretending I'm a loser, even if I am a winner. And then having to wallow in it if I am a loser. Wow, those are great options. No, thank you. No, thank you. And so the Prestige TV antihero is the fantasy imagined uh, protagonist of the dream of this, this kind of person, the person who went through the car wash and came out with those values. If I had this talent, if I had this uh, set of skills, if I was able to negotiate the machinery of our fallen world skillfully enough, I could get these rewards. I could get the, uh, the ability to be a tough guy, alpha guy and uh, not worry about feeling, uh, you know, getting, being awkward in social situations like Tony Soprano. Uh, I can uh, dominate all spaces with my, well, like a fucking supervillain like Walter White. I can seduce any woman I want, like Don Draper. And of course, these are all guys because there's a male, the male gaze is implicit in mass entertainment. But women are there too, and they're enjoying it as well because part of this is, this is for everybody, remember? Like, this is post-feminism. This is for everybody. This is what we're all seeking. And that used to be ma a, ma a male-dominated, and still is a male-dominated concept, but women are now expected to participate in it as well. Now, that's because we want to be, you know, equal, but it's also because everyone needs to have a job now. Everyone needs to have a job. So it's better to have one that's a little rewarding than it is one that sucks. And so, but what is reality TV? In reality TV world, you have people who have succeeded. Your dream. Because they're on TV. They clearly aren't doing a shitty job by virtue of the fact that you're watching them on television, and they're not. And people who know who they are. And um, wh why? It's not for skills, really. It's not for any uh, set of values or performances of etiquette or anything like that. It's, uh, it's just being themselves. It's just being themselves. It's just, just, I am so me that people should look at me. And that, anybody could get. That, and remember, these are the fantasies that we project out of our miserable reality. And so they have to plausibly, but they have to plausibly involve us in being there. We have to relate to them. That's what makes them a fantasy. It's always us that we're imagining. So we imagine that we, you have to have gone through that thing to look at these sublimated, boring t prestige TV antiheroes and go, yes. Or strip them of all the prestige shit and just watch them if there's violence, like the guys who love to, uh, the Sopranos because he shoots a lot of people. Uh, but, and then the dream of the person who does not accept those ritualized uh, 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 expectations and like has not sublimated, they look at someone who is just themselves and bursts through and succeeds on that uh, by virtue of will. Will, charisma, whatever you want to call it. And Donald Trump was one of those guys in that era that those, that uh, archetype was being created the same time it was of Obama. The same exact time it was of Obama, he was, uh, he was one of them. Donald Trump, yeah, he went to college, sure. He was a businessman, but that's not why he was the fucking uh, the, the guy. That's not why he was the king. It's because he was fucking Donald Trump. It's because he was a big orange maniac who you couldn't stop looking at. Just like everybody else on reality TV. Because even if they have a real job, they don't have a real job. There's a fucking million pawn shops. Why are we looking at this guy's pawn shop? Because he's Chumley and he's fucking the guy, the guy, three guys who look like each other's dad. I think somebody described the guys on Pawn Start. Oh, and I forgot to say, the, 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 uh, the way that, that, reality TV served as um, 
came into being as the network alternative to uh, trying to elevate content by just doing shooting real people because one thing about it was it was way, way cheaper. Reality programming is vastly cheaper than scripted programming. So it is, once again, driven by the market, driven by this competitive, this, this market being created essentially by the deregulatory framework uh, of the 70s, of the 80s and 90s, telecommunications acts and such. All of this is at every point, like you could talk, I mean, I'm talking about, you know, sort of airy stuff, but all of it ends up being driven at base by changes in material relationships. Those are in turn driven by shifts within a, the greater cultural superstructure, but the question of, the question is always, where is the, where is the conduit? And my main thesis is that what we think of as the driver is not. Nothing is driving that. I think we have reached the point where it is the market itself driving and the cultural superstructure, which was necessary to create, uh, to fill the void of coercion that, co that coercion couldn't. Because that's essentially what the superstructure is, right? What Gramsci talks about, you know, all societies are oppressed, our, our class societies are oppressive. So there is, you have to coerce people into doing stuff because they're doing it for somebody else. And once again, they have no reason to want to do that. So that has to be coerced. Culture is the thing that fills the gap where coercion can't because there can't be a guard at every door. There cannot be total surveillance in all in previous civilizations. And uh, people's conditions of life could not be so precariously balanced upon a wage relationship that could be rescinded at any time. Like we are in the thing, the main thing about Americans, the main thing that makes us the vulnerable, so precarious, the, the reason that precarity in America defines our politics in every sense is because we are so removed from our fucking means of persistence, for the most part. Our means of, um, I can't even fucking say the word, I'm so removed from it. Our, our means of subsistence. That we are fully coerced, we are fully, the, the market, what we, what we don't even think of as a political order, what we think of as natural, uh, is compelling us. Because we can never, for the most part, Say, no thanks, we can't opt out. We can't do what the uh, English peasantry could do, which was say, no thank you, I'll, uh, I'll just, I'll farm my, my, I'll do my turnips over here. I got my, uh, I got my sheep over, they go into the, 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 common, uh, the common grass over there, it's great. Yeah, no, I'll, I'm fine. In fact, in, in the England, the real starting gun of capitalism was the enclosures. When the royals went up because they couldn't get enough workers after the Black Death to do like the, to, to uh, you know, to, to create those early cottage industrial centers. Uh, because people could just stay on the land that they had traditionally lived on. Because they could graze in common. Uh, and those commons were taken and privatized and fences were put up and those people were thrown off the land and forced to go to cities and become wage laborers. But even then, at that level of development, you really could opt out. You could try to find some land. And in America for a long time, the thing that prevented us from having real revolutionary ferment in this country or developing a working class is how easy it was to sustain yourself on the land. Like that, the, that is the... Uh, like that's um, that is what's one of the elements that made the working class in the in Europe actually build up was when there was nowhere else to go. But people were packed into cities as coherent working class people, and became more and and their precarity became energized because it was part of a movement at that point because it wasn't all getting spent off by us moving literally across the continent and just failing at every level to develop the necessary uh, uh, militancy among working class people in coordination because we could always vent off the steam. We are fully, at this point in time in America, except for a very small percentage of the population, fully precarious in our subsistence. In that we don't participate in the wage relationship in some way, if we don't get a check from someone, we cannot live. In a literal sense, at least as any way we could imagine it, we would become 
not, we would not go back to the farm. We would become homeless, which is a real condition that we see around us everywhere and which is essentially the nightmare of Western civilization. Wake up in that condition. That's the Gregor Samsa reality. And that terror, it is not accompanied by any corresponding class consciousness to kindle it into coordinated action. It just exists as this fire of discontent and anxiety that drives everybody towards the most uh, hostile version of themselves, the most self-interested, the most grasping version, the most angry because you feel yourself being squeezed away from, from life. And having nothing to and can't and unable to think of anything to do about it, and that is why politics in this era now, as I have said before, is about distributing the pain, the inevitable pain of the neoliberal order to your enemies because it's their fault this is happening. We are in a sinking ship, and it's two groups of people trying to kill each other because they think that they're the reason that they slammed the iceberg. That's it. And, I mean, look at the extreme left and, like, meme people online. What are, like, the, the archetypal uh, 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 edgelord memes of the left and right? The guillotines and helicopter rides. There's no, in neither of these uh, imaginariums are you talking about justice or are you talking about a new uh, uh, worthwhile social order. Nobody has any hope in that happening. Even the fucking, the Nazis don't imagine they're going to get some Edenic splendor. And the fucking, on the, and the left, nobody's really thinking about anything beyond revenge. I'm, not, I'm obviously, this is not reality. The ship is not sinking. We could pick, fix the ship. But if, pol politi if the political horizon is as our, our mediated reality tells us it is, and as our lived realities demand that it is, this, we will, not, we will sink. And so if all we have is our ability to, to instruct our puppets to attack our enemies, we're going to do it. Because what else is to be done other than to let it happen to you? Uh, and that's why what's going what's gonna to stop this is people reigniting their faith from personal life. From experience. I know that that's a long shot, but I really do think it's the only shot we've got. And the sooner more people, and I just think the sooner more people come to that realization and act from it in a day to day basis, the sooner that kindling is going to catch. That's all I can say. Oh, God, don't talk about anarchists. Anarchists are trying to impose their fantasy notions of, of, uh, of uh, their, their liberal, secular conception of the right. Their personalized, individualized, libidinal, that is the most important part, libidinal definition of liberty. And they operate from that. And that means that they cannot get anywhere other than up their own asshole like the rest of us, one way or the other. Anarchists think they understand it. But if they're anarchists, it means that they are accepting the liberal subject, not the embedded social subject. And that means they can only go in the, in the decadent circle of, 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 of performative expression of virtue, which, sub, which is their actual desire. And part of this is because we're all operating in America from a folk understanding of freedom that is a yeoman, small, petty, individual uh, liberty. Not a socialized liberty. Like I said, the socialism that emerged in Europe emerged out of a feudal bedrock where uh, our understandings of our lives were so socially embedded and inherently socialized that our expressions of uh, of the demand for liberty from oppression have a social context that de defines them, which is why it was driven towards why, why it was driven towards socialism and why reaction took the form of, of uh, fascism. 
which similarly uh, uh, arises or it, it makes an appeal towards the social embeddedness that American liberty and American like folk conceptions of freedom never did. Folk autonomy never did. We imagine ourselves to all be petty barons. That was the Jeffersonian ideal. We 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 square the circle. We square the uh, the we, like we we divide Hobbes by Locke essentially through real estate. Like that's it, because what the the, the question of like uh, modern political theory was Hobbes and Locke. How do you fit one in the other? How do you accept the need for structures that allow for uh, social and economic intercourse? Uh, while also allowing for human liberties without destabilizing the system that allows them to flourish. This is the question. How do we solve that problem? And socialism and fascism are European responses, socially embedded European responses. The American response has only ever been, and this is why America is not a fascist country and can't be, has only ever been the Jeffersonian model of a landowner, a sufficient smallholder who is free because he cannot be economically compelled he is literally free because the the the, the modern like liberal progressive idea the understanding the synthesis synthesized version later on that became liberalism as we understand it says yes okay we would all we all know that but in reality there's it's it doesn't quite work because you have to interact with one another if you're going to facilitate trade if you're going to have a social life and so you have to give up a little bit don't you and that's like our the system of uh, the arc of america's uh, like a uh, political idea uh, uh contours are the mark of that that conflict being uh dialectically resolved first in the democrat the Je first between jefferson and hamilton then between the democrat republicans and the federalists then between the whigs and the democrats and between the Republicans and the Democrats, uh, that's the that's the movement, and uh, and like the parties have switched in their in the, their central role, but that's just that's but they have but uh, that's really more just an accident of semantics, you know, and and the Civil War more than anything defining politics regionally the way that it did. And so even our left-wing ideas of liberty are this idea of being ungoverned, which is only possible in the Jeffersonian fantasia of everyone being a little sufficient smallholder, which only works if the land is infinite, which it's not, you fucking moron! If the land's not infinite, then eventually... You have to start interacting. And once you start interacting and you have a social and you have a, an ideological structure, all of this facilitated by the reality of the material relationship, the fact that it was this massive settler colony with this incredible expanse of land, that's what made this a viable ideological superstructure on top of it in the first place. If you have this idea that no, you cannot be governed and be free. And then the necessity of integrating people into a abstract system of a uh, like national uh, economic market and uh, political uh, uh, organism, you get boom, and the first big explosion was the Civil War, which by all fucking rights should have ended with the original structure that uh, assumed that degree of autonomy broken up and a new structure created which we didn't do. And that is one of the, the, in the on the political side, you, could, you want to look at what has hobbled us politically throughout the entire history of the country. The thing, one of the, the things that, like I said, the real reason we don't have socialism is because of the, uh, the, the free real estate. But the political reason, the political expression of that deeper truth is because the Constitution's still around. Everything else is, everything else you want to talk about from the fucking New Deal and the way that the labor movement was not able to uh, continue its uh, uh, pressing its case against uh, capitalism and, and you know uh, uh, assert itself through the political organs as a as you know part of a multi-party bourgeois dictatorship, it all boils down to the constant goddamn tuition being around. 
which means if you want to pin it on one event, even though there's no guarantee that anything else would have been different, the real, the real, the real give me a fucking quantum leap jump somewhere moment for me in American history is the Lincoln assassination. Once again, no guarantee anything's really different. But I still such a, have a very hard time imagining anything being better structurally without that having to, by necessity, be the one thing, the most contingent thing that could have been changed. Because everything else is too overdetermined. There's nothing you can pull away and really expect anything else to be different. And even this is not that, I mean, it's still pretty determined, but it's just slightly less overdetermined than other moments. So I'm not a Marxist. Of course I am. What are you talking about? I think I, wasn't I just describing how the fucking material conditions have like moved through stages throughout American history through dialectical resolution? But anyway, all of this is to say that I saw a thing online Someone asked, what's your tendency? Which I think is one of the most annoying questions ever asked. And like the entire impulse, I think, to get a tendency is just picking, it's, it's very much about the subculture. It's about being part of a subculture more than anything else. Like if you're trying to do it, like if you have one for yourself is one thing, but if you make it, if you make it a part of your identity, especially online, it's, it's something else. So I've always disdained that. But thinking about the, the idea of like the post-left, this new post-left, as opposed to the 90s post-left, which was anarchy, it's like, oh, you know, uh, actually it was uh, industrialism, not capitalism, that was the problem. We have to go back to a pre-modern social order and stay there. Uh, now it's, oh, the Democratic Party has been fully taken. The thing is, is that this, the, the first clause of the post-left critique is 100% correct. I'm not really adding anything to it when I talk about it. It's correct. Everything I say about the Democratic Party is correct. But the following cause, the enemy of my enemy of my enemy reasoning, that, well, there is this, you know, working class revulsion to this, this, this neoliberal, like, woke hydra that can be channeled to defeat it. That is incorrect. That is wildly wrong, in my opinion. And I think the reason that you believe it is so that you can keep imagining that your engagement in this zone is in any way meaningful. Not just spinning the fucking hamster wheel for your own amusement. And that's why I am not post-left. I am pre-left. I am in the pre-left. Let's get it going in the chat. Pre-come, pre-left. Because... As I have said over and over again, there is no working class as such in this country. There are workers, but there's no class consciousness to go along with it that can be channeled or has been channeled into political, uh, into political action and political identity. And so that means that there isn't really even a left. The left and right are fake. The left and right are complete shadows, un unconnected, a shadow boxing among a subsection of workers and owners who share a common set collection of college-inflected uh, fundamental uh, values. And so that the left is going to come out of those people, not just those people, people who are in part of here too, but who opt out, who break free. Those people, that group, and both people within both of those are going to form some left. So this moment, the reason everyone's freaking out and yelling at each other all the time, basically, is because there isn't a real left, so everyone is just out for themselves, even if they do believe earnestly in socialism. Even if they are at the most pure of faith, it's still... Because they don't think anything can be different at base and they're not operating from any faith that things can be different. They are 
also operating out of libidinal desire, and they overlap, and so they don't notice. So yeah, I'm a pre-left. Pre And so I will keep my eyes as focused on what's in front of me as I possibly can. And if I see this left, if I see sparks and embers of this left, by God, I'll holler to the mountaintops, but not for people to do anything, for people to pay attention. Just pay a fucking attention. Because it is only through people operating at the level where their basic needs, not this sensual desire, not our pervy little recreation, but our needs are connected to a belief that we can change them. That's, the hope is the fucking thing that's missing. Hope is the thing that makes all of our political activity sterile and speculative. We don't have hope, and you can't have hope if you're online because it's designed to destroy hope. It's a acid bath for hope. Hope comes from the people around you. Hope comes from seeing the fruits of cooperation. Seeing and feeling, feeling what it means to connect with someone else and cooperate with someone else towards an end. And wouldn't you know it, doing the thing was easier and it worked. And that means that all these questions that have frozen people into these, this dance, this death, and, 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 and have met, and it made it impossible to even imagine coherent political action coming out of it, can break out of those because those concerns will simply, I submit, not appear. And if they appear, they will be dealt with. Not in some traumatic horror show that results in splintering and, and accusations so that people can take the moment to remind everybody that they're the good one, it will be in real good faith argued and real good faith resolved because everybody will be in a position to have skin in the game, know that there's a reason that they're doing what they're doing, hope that it will be successful, and then to see the results of it. And that continued in a cycle literally builds consciousness. That is what describing what I'm describing is the how it actually functions. People say it, but that's what it means. That's in practice. And the reason everyone feels like so paralyzed is because there's no practice part of it. There's no imminence. It's just dry air. We build ships and bottles and then we bring them to the fucking harbor and then we think we're going to make a yacht. So yes, let's all pre-come on the pre-left. And yes, it's a pandemic. I'm not mad at anyone for not doing that. I'm saying, don't gnaw yourself into oblivion over this shit. Replace that need to care with a sense that you're doing something. And I know it's like, well, what do you want me to do? I'm in my apartment. Like I said, just reading a book is better. That's better. Talking to someone is better, even if it's on a Zoom. Challenge yourself. Read something you wouldn't normally read on a subject you don't know anything about. Get orthogonal to your experience in some way, which I think anyone can do. And just give yourself an ability to recognize the moment when it appears instead of letting it go because you were too wound up. You were, you were mistaking forests for trees and your attentions were elsewhere. And of course, you know, get your uh, go bag ready and your survival seeds and your wind up radio and all of your MREs. Always a good idea to do that. But all of it starts with logging off. Again and again I say it, it is the mandala we come back here, and here we are. Log off.
Jordan Peter. What? Somebody said that this is Jordan Peterson for people who hate their parents, and I just that threw me because Jordan Peterson people hate their fucking parents. Why didn't they clean their room? Of course they hate their fucking parents. Why wouldn't they have cleaned their room? Why do they need this weird old Canadian man to tell them to do that? How many times did her fucking mom tell him to clean the goddamn room and it took this freak to show up? Oh, because thanks to the uh, ancient or anciently imprinted dragon slaying archetypes, you should not live in a collection of cum socks and empty Mountain Dew bottles. You needed him to tell you that? You clearly don't respect your parents. I don't know about love or hate, but you don't fucking respect them. Somebody said, uh, at the end here, Tony said, 20th century progressivism and its failures, I would say 20th century progressivism was, on its own terms, an incredibly successful project. I mean, we are living in the aftermath of it. Like, the progressive project was, how do you channel social alienation away from revolutionary militancy? And the answer was, create a government that was mixed in its economic structures enough to facilitate redistribution and minimize hyper-exploitation uh, and prevent the working class from reaching the coherence and militancy that Marx imagined would lead to the overthrow of capitalism. And it was the progressive movement that spawned the New Deal and directed it from its heights, that directed the, the purging of the uh, labor movement of communists in the 40s and 50s, and then was right there in the, in the driver's seat in the Carter administration to carve the heart out of the American working class. So on its, it was a, it was a, a successful project, and I would say of all the, even its political practitioners, most of them would agree if they were alive today. I mean, some of the more real, I mean, maybe La Follette, you know, but I'm, I'm talking about like, I'm not even talking more so much about the political, the politicians as I am the, the greater, um, you know, the army of, of uh, bureaucrats and thinkers and. Uh, and culture creators who made it. I mean, it's Woodrow Wilson's party, the Democratic Party. If 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 uh, if the Republicans are the party of Demo of Jackson, then the Democrats are the party of Wilson. And I know you say, well, they're both Democrats. That's because that slice of uh, of like the pie that was the Republican base is gone now. It's been dissolved. They were the never Trumpers, you know, like they're now they're now drifting over towards the Wilsonian side and they will they'll they'll just be end up over there. Yeah. And the Democrats are also the party of Hamilton and, and uh, Republicans are the party of Jefferson in a more abstract sense. But yeah, like that's that's been the twined that has been the central driver of the political uh, element of, you know, the greater capitalist project in America. Uh, all right. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. I think I was a few minutes late last time, so maybe I'll ask another, answer another question. Uh... Yeah, because like people say, oh, L well, Lincoln wouldn't have gotten rid of the Constitution in 1865. Absolutely not. But say that the ra a radical reconstruction is pursued that creates a that uh, manifests in a greater degree of resistance from uh, the white elite like what, what if they realize oh this isn't this is an actual surrender not a like conditional surrender oh there's this is this really is at stake and they would put up another fight but the, the, the union would have been in a much stronger position even than it was in 1861 and would have been able to win that fight too and if it had I think that by the end of that war, if Lincoln were alive, or if the successor to Lincoln, like, oh God, Thaddeus Stevens, don't let, don't, oh God, don't. 
Ooh, getting a little Thaddeus, President Thaddeus Stevens is getting me a little fla flustered there. Was in a position to remake it. That you think they're fucking bringing back the Constitution? Shit, no. Constitution's done. Bye bye. Bye bye, Constitution. And then we could have had a situation where you know we don't have this insane machinery that is designed to obfuscate power. It's designed to obfuscate power. The presidency is supposed to be commander. Is supposed to be one of the rare positions in the Western world of someone who is both the head of state and head of government. Those are usually different people. In constitutional monarchies, the head of state is ceremonial. It is the king or queen, royal family. And then you have the head of government, the prime minister, the head of the parliamentary majority. In a constitutional republic, similar thing. Like Israel uh, has a president. Ireland has a taste or a president, and they don't really do anything either. They get voted in, but they're mostly ceremonial. The real power is the head of government. We have a situation where it's supposed to be one and the same, but now I would say that the full solidification of, of like the ideological polarization and uh, within Congress, like the the full taking hold of like the post contract with America Republican Party and its control over the Senate has created a situation where for the past two presidencies, I would argue, the president has essentially been a head of state in, uh, in, in, pra in practice has been a head of state only. Wh essentially, if the head of state had like authority over foreign policy. Domestically though, they function as a head of uh, state. And the first it was Paul Ryan, I would say, at the begin, at, uh, at, from 2010. But since 2015, the Prime Minister of the United States has been Mitch McConnell. The President was Barack Obama, now, then it was Trump, and it'll be Biden now. But all through those years, it's Mitch McConnell. It will continue to be Mitch McConnell. He is the actual wielder. He is the actual head of government. But we don't think that way. We don't respond to politics that way. We don't talk about politics that way. We don't imagine power that way, which means we have no way of affecting change to this situation. And that's a situation that would not have allowed to exist, I think, because uh, in a restructuring of the American system, because there would have been a recognition of, oh yeah, this doesn't work. It only worked then because it was a fucking talking shop full of fancy boys who had a totally unified class position and this figure of George Washington to imbue the office with. It only worked, they were only able to sell the presidency because it had ill-defined powers and everyone knew George Washington was gonna be president. And it still almost buckled under that immediately. They, as soon as he was out of office, they fucking passed the Alien and Sedition Act and essentially said, yeah, forget the First Amendment that we just fucking signed. Because partisanship immediately flared up. And then it took a War of 1812 to create a, another, a, like a false dawn with the air of good feeling. But then immediately within that, uh, Van Buren and Jackson created the, the, the Democratic Party. And then the Whigs emerged as an opponent. And then the sectional crisis, which could not be con uh, constrained by constitutional order, exploded the whole thing. And it's like, yeah, it exploded the whole thing. But it was arrested. And the arresting became because... It was Lincoln's assassination. That's what stopped everything in its tracks. The worst possible person took off. The worst person in the world, basically, who conceivably could have gotten that job, got it. It's almost demonic because it's so contingent. We talk about history, you know, as this, as a, as a material drive of something that is not made up of of decisions by individuals or the outcomes of individual events because everything is overdetermined by everything else. And it's true. But within that firmament, there are moments. There are those quantum moments where the whole thing dissolves, where things move so fast that individual decisions become much, much more magnified in the uh, power of their lasting impact and a new world can be built. You've literally created a portal between worlds in moments like that. And we got the rad bad one, or the worst one. It wouldn't. There's no telling. It would have been perfect. And of course, there's always the Rod Serling chance that it would have been worse because something else would have happened that nobody could anticipate, and it would have killed everybody. Or whatever. But I'd guess it would be better.
But we don't live there, we live here. We gotta make the best of it. And let's try, folks, huh? Let's all get together for the big win. Bye-bye.